Today, welcome. Recording in progress. Recording in progress. Uh, we are uh, we're going to have our uh, faculty panel today from Fulton fa from our Fulton faculty um, here. I'm Jonathan McMichael. I'm a learning experience designer uh, at the Learning and Teaching Hub, and we're going to talk a little bit about how generative AI is being used in Fulton classes uh, today and how what experience the faculty are having with it. Uh, I'm kind of thinking of this as like a firsthand account as to what's happening in the classroom. We'll present what um, we'll have our faculty, our panel, kind of present what they're experiencing, how they're thinking about <clears throat> using it, and what what kind of insights they've gained from seeing it in their classroom. And what's really great about this panel is we have a pretty wide range of use cases, a pretty wide range of ways in which we're thinking about integrating it. And I think it's going to be a pretty uh, interesting kind of discussion. Um, goals for today. Here's our kind of agenda that's uh, here. Do a quick uh, introduction of everybody who's here on our panels. So you can get a sense of that. I'm gonna have a kind of an opening question that gives everybody a long runway to talk a little about what what they're seeing with generative AI in their classrooms and how they're thinking about using that. And then we're gonna do a hopefully a pretty long uh, and in-depth Q and A discussion that's generated by those that are in the audience. We have a couple ways. We have some people here with us. You guys can use the text number uh, to kind of text in your questions. Um, if you're online, you can go ahead and use Zoom chat. You can also upvote uh, anything that you think is really interesting. And I've got a colleague, Kristen Pena, who's like going through that, and she's going to be sending me some questions that you guys have. So as the panelists are sort of going, if you, something occurs to you that you'd like to ask about or that you want to know about, go ahead and start putting it into the chat, and I'll, start, I, I can, I'll have a ways to ask those questions uh, going forward. We'll have some quick closing remarks sort of at the end as we get close to time, but that's our kind of our game plan for today. Cool. So. Who is our panel? Well, uh, I've got a, we, we have four uh, faculty members that are joining us today. Sitting to my left right over here uh, is Brad Allenby. Uh, let me pull up your bio here. There we go. Uh, so Brad, you are the President's Pro Professor of Sustainable Engineering and the Lincoln Professor of Ethics at Emerg for Emerging Technologies at the School of Sustainable Engineering and the Built Environment. Uh, you're working with CEE 181, uh, CEE 400, uh, and CEE 581, um, all dealing with earth systems and engineering management. Uh, next to him, we've got Ryan Muth. Uh, Ryan is the Associate Teaching Professor at the Academic and Student Affairs at, and the School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence at Fulton School of Engineering. His focuses are in first-year engineering courses and computer science classes. He's currently a member of the first-year uh, programming team and leads all modalities in the CSE 110 and the CSE 205 courses, totaling over 5,000 students. Thanks. Join us. We have uh, Jenny. We should have put these in order. Um, Jenny Wong, um, you're an instructor uh, with the Academic and Student Affairs starting in 2003, so you're just getting started in your teaching experience that's here. Your primary responsibilities are to support first-year engineering students. Jenny instructs uh, Intro to Engineering, FSC 100, both in person and online, and is also the director of the Fulton Accelerated Community Engagement Program, which aims to develop a diverse leadership mindset in our first-year uh, engineering students. Uh, your secondary affiliation is with the School of Bio, Bio, Biological and Health Systems and Engineering, uh, where she has uh, facilitates methods in molecular and cellular biology, the BME 362 course as well. And joining us uh, via Zoom is Jan Shodostajvili. Sorry, Jan. Um, Jan's the Associate uh, Professor for the School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence and the Associate Director for the Center of Cybersecurity and Trusted Foundations. You're the, also the Director of the American Cybersecurity Education Institute. You have been teaching CSE 194, uh, which is the Cybersecurity History and Culture, 365, Intro to Cybersecurity, and 466, Computer System Security. So thank you all for joining us to talk about your pretty wide-ranging experiences across uh, that. So without further ado, we're going to get into our kind of first question. It's here. And basically, how are you integrating and accommodating generative AI in your courses? And what impact do you see it kind of having both on your approach as an instructor and kind of the student learning experience kind of in your courses? Brad, I know you're, wor you're kind of working it into some assignments that you already had before and having students kind of mandatorily use generative AI in that. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Absolutely. Um, when ChatGPT first came out in November, uh, 
I essentially rewrote the syllabi that I was teaching for that semester because if you're, if you're familiar with emerging technologies at all, the one thing that impresses you is how powerful they are, how much change they create, not just directly, but indirectly. The railroads, the automobile, steel, coal. <clears throat> and looking at ChatGPT, it clearly is probably the most fundamental change in technology that we've had since the Enlightenment because unlike all of those other technologies, the transportation, the electricity, it's cognitive. So that puts an enormous burden on the academic community to respond quickly and adaptively. So what I did was I rewrote my syllabi so that um, instead of providing a prompt that I wanted the students to write an essay about, because we constantly get complaints about our engineering students can't communicate. Yeah. Uh, so try to teach them to communicate. Eh? Uh, I, instead of just giving them the prompt and having them write it, I gave them the prompt. I told them to get a generative AI, ChatGPT, to write the response. And then I told them that I wanted that submitted along with their analysis and critique of what ChatGPT said. Mm -hmm. uh, Twofold purpose. The first was just to get them to use the technology. Yep. And the second was to force them to have to ride the technology to provide their answer, the Centaur model, which those of you that have worked with, with generative AI know is the way the Pentagon claims they're approaching it. Um, and I've done that on all my courses, varies depending on the syllabus and the course, uh, but it responds to something that I've begun to see even more strongly recently, and that is the people, the students that know how to use it and are interested in using it are a small uh, number of students compared to the rest. Many have not even used it yet. Mm -hmm. My personal feeling is if ASU lets anybody graduate who has not extensively experienced ChatGPT at this point, then that's a failure. That's a, that's a flat out failure. That is not consistent with our responsibility to uh, help our students adjust to the world as it is. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point that you're saying, because I, I would say there are going to be people saying using or integrating chat GPT into our educational environments presents a risk into itself. But what you're saying is actually not having them have any kind of exposure to it at all. That's almost a bigger risk because we're not actually preparing them for the world that they're in. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, ChatGPT is an extraordinarily powerful technology. Yeah. And if we graduate, particularly in engineering, yeah. if we graduate an engineering student yeah. that doesn't know how to use it and isn't comfortable with it, we failed because one year, two years out, they're going to be obsolete. Yeah, that's a really good point. Ryan, how are you? How are you kind of using generative AI? You're using it in a different way. It's kind of informing your instructional approach. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, much more selfish, uh, <laughs> and, and using it to make my job easier mm, yeah. most often. Um, so uh, the first thing that I started using it for was uh, developing new assignments and things like that for my courses. I give it a quick little prompt. Uh, it spits me back a description of the assignment, example code, what the output should be, and then I refine that right, and that accelerated my process for updating assignments in my classes pretty significantly. Um, I also use it for processing uh, like muddiest points every week. So I put out a survey to, I have hundreds, sometimes thousands of students in a class, put out a survey to all those students and rather than me spending an hour running through all of those comments and distilling things out, I copy and paste it into ChatGPT with a please summarize this prompt and it spits me back my top 10 with quotes and probably even example um, um, summaries and, and things like that. And it saves that process a lot and it helps me adapt to my class faster and spend more time on that generating the answers to that rather than just doing the analysis. Um, additionally, uh, we're looking at ways of supporting students in programming and in problem solving uh, more immediately. I have a lot of online students. I have a lot of students that work outside of the normal business hours, right? So providing um, uh, chat support or problem solving support uh, either through a chatbot interface or um, through like intelligent responses to students that are working on a programming problem. 
Um, we're investigating, that's all really new stuff, but we're trying to figure out how we can use these systems to sort of augment the educational experience and support students as they're struggling so that they're continually moving forward. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. So like part of it is thinking about where, how ChatGPT can help you do things that were like maybe either previously impossible or just really, really like effort intensive processes. Yeah, like totally. you might've read through those muddiest points before, but having it and kind of give you a process makes you more reactive to them in the moment. You're not having to feel like I can't, I have, I need two weeks to process where, where our students are. Right. You can do it within 10 minutes and get a sense of yeah, that. Absolutely. That's great. Jenny, how are you, how are you seeing in your classroom? Um, I think that I'm in a more unique position because I started in fall of 2023. So I am currently on my second semester of instructing and having access to both first year students and third year students allows me to see how the students are able to interact with it as a resource and as they're learning as they go. So graduating with my master's in May of 2023, I was in grad school when ChatGPT started coming out and I was seeing how my peers were utilizing it to what, how they were, wanted to implement it into their classes, use it to support their learning. And I've influenced, I've used that as an influence on the way that I structure my teaching. Mm -hmm. So I, as an instructor, do not ban ChatGPT. I actually encourage the use of ChatGPT in my classes as long as the students cite that they use ChatGPT. So I personally want to help the students identify where their thought process ends and where ChatGPT starts and vice versa. Because realistically, I think that using ChatGPT as a resource is no different than a student maybe five years ago using a textbook as a resource, but then just copying exactly what they wrote down or saw in the textbook as their answer. And so I focus more on having the students identify where their critical thinking begins as a launching point from using their online resources. Mm -hmm. They're gonna have the online resources. And me saying that they can't use it in their class is not gonna stop them from using it because I don't monitor them outside of the you know, 150 minutes I spend with them mm -hmm. during the week. Yep. I think my most controversial one is probably that I let them use it on their exams yeah. because I have a biomaterials class this semester and their exams are open internet because they have to be able to utilize literature sources and source them themselves to support their answers on their exams. And the reason I let them use ChatGPT as well is because in the workforce, I foresee their manager coming up to them and asking them to provide them some sort of information about a project that they're doing, but they're not gonna have to do it immediately on the spot. They're gonna have time to go back to their resources, mm -hmm. collect the data that they want to, and then formulate their response. And that's how I like to assess my students. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. You're just getting started, and not mm -hmm. to give anything away, Brad, but you've been, you've been doing this for a little bit. Like, uh, <laughs> you're coming to the same con kind of conclusion is that they need to be interacting with this because there's learning value. And almost, and I would say from a learning design perspective, there's this metacognitive, I need to learn how I work with this. How, in what ways is it making me better? In what ways is it substituting the thought that's out there? And so I think that's a really interesting point that you're paying attention to the kind of work or the way that your students are thinking about those assignments, that's more important than saying this use is okay and this use isn't okay. It's more adaptive to where the students are and how they're learning. I think that's a really, really great point. Uh, Jan, you, uh, you're using it in kind of like a, almost a very different way, but you're thinking a little bit about how it might be assistive to a wide range of students adapting to how they're learning and going through and kind of tacking it onto a really comprehensive uh, learning environment that you've built. Yeah, and we lucked out with this um, because it, it kind of came at uh, the right time for us to take advantage of. Uh, during COVID, we went all in on a, an integrated uh, educational environment called Cone College, um, in which students tackle a number of um, uh, different routes through cybersecurity curricula, uh, fully online with recorded uh, classes, with uh, kind of... Uh, uh, live help sessions and with a web-based environment that um, oversees their entire learning journey. And the existence of this integrated environment allowed us once the GPT API was uh, out there and usable and, and, and very accessible to just kind of uh, plug things in super, super easily. Um, and this has been kind of uh, awesome. So what we've mostly done is used uh, GPT to create a sort of always available, uh, always attentive, personalized tutor for the students. Um, a tutor that can look over their shoulders and see 
the um, computer science uh, like solutions that they're working on, you know, to these cybersecurity challenges. Oftentimes, this takes the form of code that they have to write to see the input and output um, of every program they run, um, and increasingly to integrate more and more data, right? And so they get stuck. They can go to the AI and they can ask uh, questions that are, um, you know, would be very frustrating for humans, like. I don't know what's going on. Something is going wrong. Like like students that uh, are are stuck enough to ask for help typically often don't know how to ask for help well. But they had this AI tutor that's been silently watching them over their shoulder the whole time, and suddenly it knows often what is going on and it can help and it can say, oh, it looks like you have a single quote here. You should have a double quote. That's why you're getting this error. Boom, and these sort of, especially these little issues that take, you know, potentially a half hour for for a, a human uh, instructor to finally track down, they can be uh, identified immediately. Um, so, for the most part, we use um, AI in this uh, platform support perspective. Um, that that you know, this is just the the initial use of it, right? Um, we uh, implemented this fairly quickly in, in a couple months. It's been live for six months. We're working on uh, additional uh, capabilities um, in the platform, but the initial one is this this uh, all real-time, basically always available, individualized tutor. Yeah, and so I think that's really interesting because your platform has kind of discrete uh, challenges that you've kind of mapped out to say, well, these are the skill sets and that got kind of mapping uh, allows them to be engaged with what is kind of in kind of authentic work. You can then sort of say, well, this is what they should be doing, and you can have it sort of recognize the patterns where students are kind of going through, which allows for, especially at the scale that you're thinking about offering this kind of platform to, you can't. That's that is functionally impossible if you were to do it with just humans watching over that. So it opens yeah. up a brand new platform for how stu how learning can occur um, going forward. It's it's a fundamental change for this platform specifically. Uh, we have about 2,500 active learners every month right now, right? And that's just impossible to offer individualized help for. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, GPT scales uh, as much as we can pay for tokens. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, do you, do you ever get a sense that they are, um, that do students kind of recognize that it is AI trying to help them and uh, with the, also the awareness that like sometimes it gets things wrong or it, like create something, there is a degree of error that goes in with using artificial intelligence, at least for the systems that we have now. Yeah, we've definitely observed this. Um, we don't hide that it's AI, of yeah. course. Um, the, the platform is all uh, uh, martial arts based, so it's called the <laughs> dojo. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the technical platform that implements it is called the dojo. The, the whole learning environment is called Pwn College. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Dojos have sensei that teach students, and this is the sense A with an AI. <laughs> nice, I like that. That's great. That's awesome. So, um, I, as a reminder to the audience, uh, I put up before we're looking for your questions, so feel free <coughs> to send them in, and we'll be asking them. I got a couple follow-ups that I'm going to send over to the group as well. But like, hopefully, you get a sense that we've a pretty wide range of ways in which generative AI is infl infecting or uh, affecting, not infecting, <laughs> affecting um, AI could be the other as well. Um, so, uh, I want to ask a question um, kind of based off something that I had read recently by an ASU uh, faculty member who's actually teaching in philosophy. And he wrote a really interesting blog post on uh, APA online where he's describing his experience with AI and how he's kind of adapting uh, to that. And he kind of goes in and speaks a little bit to this automated tutor sort of uh, idea, and he has his hesitance a little bit on that. He kind of goes in to says that auto automated tutors can be helpful, helpful, but students will also need intellectual coaches, interactions, and experienced faculty who can encourage them to develop themselves in lots of different ways. And one of the things that he points out is that um, kind of thinking about student motivation, that if outsourcing academic tasks feels like, doesn't feel like deception, if, it does, if you don't think anybody cares about what you actually know, um, and it's just a game that you're kind of playing and going through. And so I wonder, in a world in which we have generative AI and you could give answers, you could have an entire discussion post be presented. You say, I'm asked to respond to this discussion post. Tell me what I should say and think or reflect on in that way, and AI can do that. 
what kind of incentives would you give to students to say, well, that's not actually, that's actually robbing you of the learning that's, that's there. And in other words, like, how do you show students that what they know still matters in an AI-based world? Brad, you want to? Yeah, the that? first thing you have to ask is, does it? Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, you know, one of the things that, that up until November we spent a lot of time doing is trying to train students to communicate. Yeah. If, <clears throat> if ChatGPT is able to do communication mm -hmm. better than any of our students, yeah. and at least based on my experience, it is, Mm -hmm. um, then the question should be, what is it that you need to be teaching your students? It's not how to write well, because ChatGPT is always going to be better. Yeah. And, and, and what follows up. I mean, the other thing to remember is ChatGPT is, is a little itty-bitty baby. Yeah. What's, what's coming down the pike is, is far more uh, powerful. If that's the case, then one of the fundamental questions that I think a place like ASU needs to ask is what on earth do we need to teach, period? Mm -hmm. One of the things that we need to do in engineering is we need to go back and zero base budget our entire curriculum. <laughs> a lot of it's obsolete. Yeah. And the students are going to know it, and it's painful. Why do you think students cheat so much? Well, part of it is that some of them learn how to do it, and it's easy and convenient. Part of it is education's become transactional. And part of it is we're wasting their time. Yep. I mean, what the flip? Well, I mean, I think it gets into that generative AI makes, removes the plausible deniability from some of the stuff that we probably were doing beforehand when it comes to education. And what I would, what I would say is, like, I would maybe disagree in that it, I think communication would be really important, but there will be AI-mediated communication and how you're leveraging that. Um, at, there's a great... Um, Ethan Mollick, is, he works at the Whartons, uh, and he writes a lot about Wharton School of Business, and he w writes a lot about AI. And one of his great quotes that he tells his students is like, ChatGPT can write a good paper, so why would I make you write a bad paper and turn it into me? Instead, you're, the base standard right. is a good paper, and you need to add something beyond the value of well, what AI is, is offering you're a, us. You're a PR person for a company, yeah. and something goes south. Yeah. You know, the first thing you do is you go and you get ChatGPT to write five sample press releases. Mm. Then you go in and you know the company, you know your customers, you know the stakeholders, you know the environment, you know the politics, and then you rewrite it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But that's a that's a higher level of thinking than even the generation part, right? It's Absolutely. the evaluation part. Yep. You have to Absolutely. you have to know some fundamentals in order to be able to say this is a good answer or a bad answer right. from this tool and then take it to that next step. So we're actually, I think what it's gonna force us to do is push our students up that Bloom's taxonomy layer up to evaluating and critiquing and modifying from all of these other sources, but they still need those fundamentals in the early parts to be able to say, like, these are my core skills, yep. and then use yep. it as a partner and evaluate whether or not the answers is giving me a good. And, and that raises a really significant problem that we're also ducking, and that is, um, uh, equality, mm. yes, because the students that are capable of that kind of thinking as rapidly and as powerfully as the AI is going to push it, that's not all of our students. Yeah, well, and, and it, but, how but, we adjust that is going to be a major issue. But I think what kind of Jan is getting at is that he's seeing a change in the learning curve to say we can accelerate that, and are there ways in which we can leverage that to accelerate and bring people up to that at that level and. I think this gets into a, a really nice sort of thing that understanding still matters because I, I say this all the time about AI is like you need to know what it's talking about because it doesn't know what it's talking about and you 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 are only yet. interpreting yet right <laughs> there, it has, doesn't have semantic <laughs> things yet so it may be able to get concepts but I think this is a really interesting way in which you've set up your class Jenny is that like you are saying you can use it but I need to see the value add that you're adding on top of that and you've already set, set your class up to kind of be that way exactly and I think part of it is because the main reason that I feel like students use and rely on their resources and whether or not they're heavily relying on their resources is that they don't have the confidence in themselves yet to believe that what they have is more valuable than what an AI can provide and I feel like part of an instructor is being able to build that confidence up in your students and say, hey, you have the skills to put this together. We've been working on these skills. What you have to say is more valuable to what we have to contribute to this specific problem set, this specific you know, case 
study that we're doing than AI does because we're trying to build them up to understand that they don't need to just use ChatGPT's words to pass the class. And I think that just goes back to how you're evaluating students and what are you putting emphasis on within your class? Are you emphasizing, well, I want my students to get X amount of points so that they can earn X grade, or are we emphasizing we want the students to be able to reach the learning objectives rather than reaching the grade that they want for their GPA? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, I think that's a, that's a great way of sort of thinking about what is the point of what we're doing in, these, in, in the classroom. And you're, because you're working with early early like undergraduates and like people who are there early on, you're almost having to do a little bit to build their confidence up to say what you do actually does matter and what you think matters and that replic like don't sell yourself short because you don't think you write as well as what the GPT does. Maybe it will always be the case that it writes better than you, but you have something to add to what its insight is. Even if it's just focusing its attention on something that you're noticing, that is a skill set. And part of that is, I think, when we're adjusting to have students come in, if we've gamified it and you need it, it needed to look the right way or feel the right way, well, the students who couldn't achieve that kind of get to a place where they'll say, well, this isn't for me or I don't belong in this. And I think by saying it will format it in a way that looks really good, but you need to, it needs to be obvious to me what the value add that you're, at, you're, you're bringing that, what addition you're bringing to that. I'd say, Jan, you're doing the same kind of thing. Like the challenges are the challenges. If you can pass them, like you have the skill set that's there, but um, and so it demonstrates that in that for the way you've structured it and say once you like almost gamified that if you can do this You have shown yourself more than anybody else that you have the skill to to engage in the material Yeah, and that definitely helps our students um, Kind of keep the confidence that it's not just AI helping um, Some I think you mentioned earlier. What if the AI is wrong and it's often Yep. pretty wrong and yep. you know we, we review a lot of these uh, uh interactions uh actually with also with the help of ai tools and there's an enormous amount let's say a significant amount of students yelling at the ai <laughs> no you idiot that's not what's happening um but uh you know these are all like learning even in those interactions we see them getting confidence that they understand the material and then they solve it and they're like oh and then they start talking to the AI. They're like, look, this is what was happening all along. Um, so yeah, I think having that, that understanding of the students um, is very important, that, that they are learning something interesting. They're not just you know, a, a middleman between uh, uh, old, you know, the GPT API and, and, and the challenge problems or the, the prompt. The, uh, the interesting thing there is, um, you know, uh, earlier uh, it was mentioned that that um, the AI is just going to get smarter, right? So uh, next year it might be just solving all of these education challenges outright. That's going to be an interesting challenge um, because once once the AI gets too good and we have to start actively uh, kind of clipping its wings and and helping people. I think a lot of these questions will arise, right? Like, you know, if you can paste the prompt into the AI and then you can have it critique itself, which you can already put in there, it might not be very good, but it'll increasingly get better and better. I think then we'll start having these really um, existential questions of, of like, you know, what are we teaching these students to really do? Um, might be tricky. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that is probably one of the conversations that's coming that's going to come up uh, soon is like, what are there going to be times in which we have to restrict access to AI because we, you need to build a foundational, fundamental skill set that the AI ha already has available to you, but your understanding and knowledge is important for uh, as a foundation for future skill sets or future understanding, and I think that will be an interesting part to say the questions are we're not seeing progress within students. Uh, because they're lacking some found fundamental understanding in that way. And like, I think we're hitting a moving target. Both we're trying to hit our students and we're trying to hit where the technology is right now. And you have to kind of be aware of both of them to do that. Well, and third target, if yeah. I can, yeah, sure. is our students go out in a year or two, are they gonna be able to adapt to what the AI is doing? Yeah. Uh, well, what's our, point. I what's mean, our target four years from now? Jamie and I teach freshman year, right? right. Four yeah, years from now, too. it's only, yeah. you said November when JPT came out, right? It's only been a, a little over a year. Well, and, and it was <laughs> uh, ChatGPT in November 
was kind of deliberately a low ball mm -hmm. because they wanted to get people used right. to chat GPT before they dropped yeah. the next version, which yeah. is really scary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I mean, I think, I think that, that this has to exist on a number of levels. It has to exist on what you do now in the classroom, how you make it better, how you think about your students, but then it also has to exist on, you know, these students are gonna graduate and they're gonna be out in the world where this thing is just gonna blow them away unless we figure out how to give them something, yeah. some resilience somehow. And I haven't seen a lot of attention paid to that at all. Yeah, well, I mean, actually we have a, a voted question here that's kind of getting at some of the stuff that, that you're kind of talking about. And I would say, um, I mean, this panel is, I think, on the forefront of thinking about some of those things because you're already thinking like, how I'm teaching is gonna to have to change the next time we do this. So the question we got here is, uh, how do you suggest to balance the need for students to communicate in written language um, with having AI doing the work for them? Uh, we need students to develop real intelligence. Uh, when, when things go wrong, our students need to probe deeper, uh, deeper have understanding to distinguish misinformation from disinformation, or disinformation and dis misinformation from the factual evidence-based knowledge that's available. So part of that is how I think you're kind of alluding at that, we need to be thinking about habits of mind. What are the habits of mind that we think about when we're using generative AI? Because those will be the things that persist beyond them being here, is to say, it was one way and I adapted during that, but really it was the process that I've used to adapt that will stay with me throughout. So Jenny, how are you thinking in your classes? Because you're having them adapt to both succeed at college first and then think about how you succeed in industry. Yeah. So. I think, can you repeat that second part of the question one more sure, time? Sure, absolutely. Uh, our students need to probe deeper. Um, so when things go wrong, our students need to probe deeper and to distinguish misinformation and disinformation from the model, of, from the model it, that it provides from the factual evidence-based knowledge that we kind of know. So like it's providing text. Mm -hmm. It may be based on real knowledge and it may be based off disinformation or incorrect information or maybe wrong in some way. So how do you teach them how to discern between those two things? So for my classes, like I said before, I let them use ChatGPT however they want as long as they cite it, but then they have to be able to add something on on top of that so that they can distinguish what information they're being fed and they know where it's coming from within the source and then where it's coming. And I apply that as well with, like any other instructor does, if you use another academic source, you cite it. And so having them start to realize where they're pulling information from and being able to vet their own sources as well as understanding the typical responses that come out of ChatGPT and having them know the type of language that they're being feed it, like fed. So for any assignments that we provide my students in like my FSC 100, my grad TAs, and my TAs and I, we go through and we run our prompts through ChatGPT to kind of see what the responses we're typically getting are. And so it's kind of a catch safe for myself where if I see similar responses within the students but they're not citing it, then I know that they're using the generative AI as a way to minimize the work that they have to put in versus mm -hmm. using it as a tool and learning how to use it as a tool. And I think that the more that we integrate it within the classroom and the more accepting that instructors become, the more they're gonna be able to practice with it. Because the more I believe that the students interface with it, they'll understand and be able to grow that growth mindset on how to respond to things but they can only do that with practice. Yeah, so I mean, two things that, that I think are really interesting. You're using the citation model as a like, you are accountable for what you put in this, and the citation is a mechanism by which you can make a student accountable for what they have used. And then the second part that I think is important, and Jan kind of got at it with how he's thinking about looking and uh, reviewing the advice that this thing is giving, is that you are having to test. It's changing, what it's saying is changing, you're preemptively sort of saying, I notice patterns that it's giving students right now, and I can start to anticipate where it, where students' uh, work is coming in. So that, that testing part's an important part for you to and, do. Yeah. And it's especially important in my first year classes because they're coming in and they don't necessarily make that distinguishing like point between this is what I think it is and this is what a source is telling me because mm -hmm. they're still learning. And so being able to do those test cases and identify the typical language that an AI or any search engine would be able to feed them allows me to have those conversations with the students early on. If I can see in their assignments that they're using generative AI but they're not citing it, why are they not citing it? Is it because once they read that source, they're believing it wholly as true and they're internalizing that as their own thought and then it becomes their own thought process or are they not understanding 
that distinction between this is my own genuine critical thinking and this is something that I've just read online multiple times and now I'm internalizing as true. Yeah. And you're, so what you're trying to get at is, is kind of like you're trying to evaluate their process mm -hmm. more than the artifact itself, yes. right? And I think that's a critical distinction in what sort of all of our assign most of our assignments are based on artifacts. This is the paper that you're getting graded on. This mm -hmm. is the uh, code or submission that you're turning in. But what's more important is the process the students go through to generate that thing, right? So maybe revisions or critiques or um, you know, what is the development process when you get feedback, what happens, what do you do if something goes wrong, what do you do if, if requirements change, stuff like that yep. is a lot harder for the system right now to be able to handle, but that's a critical skill that is actually useful and transferable across domains for, for students. And well, and what you're doing is like unique to a human being being in the course doing that thing. Mm -hmm. There is social pressure, there's social expectation, there's a little bit of mentorship that goes in with that. It's not just the transfer of information. It's like, I'm a person and I can ask you the question, I did this and got a very similar answer to you, what you mm -hmm. turned in. Did you use this? And like, and I think you, the empathetic way in which you're approaching it is to say, maybe you did just internalize that information and that happens a lot with like early undergraduate students is like, they don't know any different, they think, well, that's the right answer. I'm just gonna say that. Why would I need to know, distinguish my thoughts from someone else's thoughts that are in that, in that way? So I think that's, that's okay, that's really fascinating. So what do you, what do you think, Brad, about like this idea of like teaching the, to the, the, the learner themselves and having this idea that the product can't speak for the learner's perspective anymore, that we, we don't have that anymore? That might have not always been the case for a while now. We've had contract cheating and other stuff too that we've had to think about as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I had a plagiarism incident where I was discussing it with the student and the student got upset because they had paid good money <laughs> to an outside <laughs> supplier yep. and the outside supplier had plagiarized the product. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and they felt this was extremely unfair. So I said they had two problems. One was gonna be with the dean's office and the other one was uh, they had a breach of contract issue and they could take it up with their lawyer. Um, <laughs> I think the problem we've got is, and, and Jan spoke to this, uh, and did you, Ryan, you know, all of us have 100, 200, 300 person classes. And I remember in the Wall Street Journal when this came up, some letter writer wrote in and said, well, if you only sit down with the student every week for 10 minutes, you could figure out what they knew. <laughs> and you can't do that <laughs> at ASU, you yep. just can't. Not only are we at, at limits now, but we're trying to push beyond those limits. Um, the only way we're gonna be able to do that is to rely more and more on AI. So what we're doing is relying more and more on AI to carry the burden of an education that we can no longer, as people, give our individual students. Yep. And I think this kind of conundrum is going to keep coming up because yep. the technology, as well as the financial issues at, at ASU are gonna push us in that direction. Yep, yeah, yeah, the student population can scale, but it's really hard to scale the individual effort that you have to put well, in. you can't. Yeah, exactly, I mean, exactly the, right, the, yeah. The and idea is, of course you can and you can't. Yeah, right, exactly. So so I think I see it as like, as AI is our partner and it's the student partner as well, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we set up our courses so that knowing that every student has an AI apprentice, and they're really the manager of that AI apprentice, how do we upskill their thinking and their way of approaching problem solving in a way that they're, they're critical, they can judge um, and, and do problem solving of larger scale problems and engage with that process and then self-evaluate, right? And maybe the AI is doing the grunt work for that, but they're still responsible for, as an entity, what you're doing. And then it's on us to use the same tools to be able to evaluate their performance and how they're doing it. I think you said two really important things. One is that they're a manager. We don't teach them to be a manager right. of, of the substantive product of their profession, but that's exactly what they are and they have to, they have to learn how to be that. And the second is problem solver. Mm -hmm. You know, right now, goodness knows what it's gonna be six months from now, but right now, AI does not solve human problems because they're too complex. Mm -hmm. Our students can do that, but we don't teach them how to be problem solvers. Yep. We teach them how to do, this is 
a gross insult. We teach them how to do chug and plug engineering. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that is just not enough. Yeah, yeah. But part of it is like knowing, to be able to problem solve, you have to know sort of the domain and what is possible and right. how to sort of bring these big pieces together, right? You have right. to have some level of abstraction, yeah. which requires some fundamentals. So I don't think those are gonna go away, but maybe they're de-emphasized for a higher level problem solving. Maybe um, you know we switch to things like using block coding in, and thinking about this is how I take a problem apart, using focusing on computational thinking or uh, problem solving practices rather than where does my semicolon And go? on the social right. and the political and the economic, things that we don't teach. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can get AI to do technical stuff, but so far, being able to solve highly complex human problems, gun rights, abortion, yep. uh, violence in the Sahel, that's not something AIs can do yet. Yep. Yeah, and so I, I think one of the things that we, <clears throat> and Jan actually has a, <clears throat> A good example of this is that he's kind of articulated the specific problems that go into the domain and then outline what they are and then give them specific challenge that go around each of those things. So one way, an approach that we're kind of seeing here is to say, all right, identify all the, the necessary skill sets that are there, but then provide that connective tissue that brings it all together that says this is what domain knowledge is. And I would say from a learning design perspective, one of the things that we definitely know is that the ability to think critically and problem solve is very much related to your level of knowledge about a specific subject. You don't see possibilities that other people might see. Teaching discrete problem solving, you can have some processes, but as you learn more and understand more and internalize more things, you start to see possibilities, and then you start using the tools that are available to you as, as a way to, um, to focus their attention on the specific problem that's there, because that's the other part that GPTs don't have right now, is the ability to focus themselves on for certain things. They need us to tell them, go look at this thing and tell me what you think about this. Um, I wanna hit another question that got upvoted here real quick and then we're running, we've got 15 minutes left. Um, when introducing Gen AI uh, to your students, what conversations are you having around um, them being cognizant of the inherent biases that exist within some of that stuff? So the representation of the model that's there, we don't know exactly what's in there, but there are ideas that certain ideas get overrepresented and other ideas that maybe get underrepresented in some of the models. Jan, you talked a little bit about how it makes mistakes. Are you noticing patterns of mistakes? Do you let, how, how are you thinking about letting students know to say it gets this kind of thing wrong a, a lot, so you'd be careful about that? Yeah, um, we definitely noticed a very interesting thing where um, it equates uh, education. So uh, in the prompt, we tell it, hey, you're a, a tutor uh, overseeing a student working their way through an educational environment. And uh, we had a lot of problems early on where they're assuming that an educational environment means that the uh, interactions with the computer aren't um, real in some sense, that they're emulated, that um, the interface, the, the programmatic interface is, uh, was created just for this uh, education thing and they're not actually using real programming languages. And, and it would say crazy things to students based on this uh, um, misunderstanding. And I think it is probably because there's some large training uh, data set portion, which, which is like that, that, hey, this is some educational material and, and it's, it's a, a kind of a, an, an abstracted uh, version of reality. Um, and it learned to, to go with that. Um, We've done a lot of prompting to avoid this, um, and, but there's just other stuff that we have to tell students. Um, but listen, you know, if you start asking it like these extremely specific uh, uh, things about uh, the flow of variables to a program as you're debugging, it's going to get really confused. So keep in mind the the limits. Right now, it's on that level. Um, with more data, one really cool thing is the more students use this system, the more data we have. Right now in six months, we've had about 32,000 uh, messages exchanged between students and uh, the AI tutors across 3,000 uh, something help sessions. Um, and the more data we get, the more pitfalls we're aware of. And so then we can start actually working in like both remedies as in we tell GBD, hey, just so you know, you're you you frequently make this this mistake. Let's let's try not to mislead the student in this way, or tell the students like these are the common mistakes that Sensei makes. Be careful. Yep, that's really good. I'm I'm going to combine this question around the idea of 
letting you know it's biased with another one that I think is a really good one here, which is um, how do you model the use of AI in your course to students? Like there, you know, especially within students who are using it for the first time, you might say, well, this is how I think about using this, and you can model and kind of vocalize like this is, or like model to them how you're thinking about using this, what you're seeing, what you're noticing, those types of things. Are there ways in which you're modeling this is the way I think is a good way to use this for my particular course? Or are you just saying go at it and figure it out on your own? I don't want to influence the way that you're going about that. How are you guys thinking about that? I mean, I personally let them kind of explore on their own and then I encourage them to ask me questions if they find something that they don't, that doesn't necessarily sit right with them. A good way that I demonstrate it specifically in class is when we start coding our Arduino cards, our carts, because they have, they're all learning programming languages for the first time for a majority of them. Mm -hmm. And Arduino is not similar to like if they're taking your CSC 110 class, it's not like Java. Like there are bits and pieces that you can kind of get in with syntax, but at the end of the day, it's a completely different language. And so I show them how ChatGPT can be used to kind of debug things and how I use it myself too sometimes when they come to me and they have a question and I don't know and I use it as a resource, but then I also show them, okay, after I look at it here, I go and I look at like the official Arduino website and I cross-reference and I see exactly where it comes from. Mm -hmm. So I demonstrate it that way in my class. Do you, have, you, have you shown them that like it made a mistake or this isn't correct when you cross-checked it? Have you seen Oh, absolutely. It? So it's like, yeah, it's like, it's biased. It doesn't do this well. Let me show you that it's not doing this like, well. Like we'll take code from a student who there's a bug and they can't figure out why. We copy and paste it into ChatGPT. We run it. We copy and pass, paste the edited code back in, and it still doesn't run. And then so from there, we go through and we try to figure out and we walk through the code and say, OK, this is what it had us change, but it's still not working. Now this new issue comes in, and then we outsource to other resources that are available online as well. Yeah, yeah. for programming classes in particular, ChatGPT is really good <laughs> at taking an assignment prompt and then generating code, whether that code is correct or not is totally random, mm -hmm. right? Um, because it's not a compiler, it's just a thing, it's a fancy parrot, right? Yeah. It's gonna repeat back things it's heard yeah. or mix it, you know, remixes of things that it's heard. So um, it can get really close, but it's never going to like run the code itself and check it and you know, make sure that it, it runs or anything like that. At least not now. for, not now, you know, next year it'll be different. Yeah. But um, uh, that's one hook. And the other thing is to preface uh, sort of the intrinsic motivation of students, right? To say, this thing is here for you, but you're kind of in competition with it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I can take the assignment from my class and dump it right in and get a good answer from it. Why would I pay you to be able to do that as a, as a student that's graduating from computer science or something like that, right? So now it's, it's up to you to be able to know how to do these things so that you can leapfrog this technology and use it yourself as a, as a tool, but that means that you have to have an intrinsic motivation for your own learning, yeah. right? If you're using it as a crutch, you're not actually doing the work and you're not getting any value out of it. So how do you phrase it as, how do you interact with it as a tutor to get, uh, reinforce your learning and uh, rather than doing the work for you, right? And trying to build that sense around it yeah. of, of uh, sense around it for students of, you know, Use it to your advantage. This is than this is for you. This yes. this whole experience is for you, and it's, that's the thing that like uh, Professor Watson uh, wrote in his blog post is that he, the, he is get, still getting good responses when he says, "This, if you have it substitute the busy work of of this, you are robbing yourself of the intended like learning experience that you are paying for that you are enrolled here to do." He said, "Certainly, there are students that they're fine with that and completing the course is their main priority." But they, the, he, he got the sense that most students kind of understand that if you've just set up something for me, I actually want to learn that kind of stuff because I recognize that like I'm in competition with this thing and I need to be, the ultimate test isn't whether what grade I get in here, it's how well does this class prepare me for the next thing that I have to go and want to do. Yeah. And I think they see, like I, this generation is very aware of competition. Like yeah. they're aware that it's a competitive <laughs> world that's out there. Brad, what do you think? I. Uh, so I also lecture at the law school, yeah. and, and the law profession is, is going bat guano mm -hmm. over this stuff, for obvious reasons. But there's a really good case that I use in all my classes, which, which uh, provides a, an object lesson for students. There's a, um, a case called um, Mata versus Avianca, mm -hmm. case in federal court. One of, the, uh, one of the lawyers, a seasoned lawyer, 
had ChatGPT prepare his filing. ChatGPT did a great, great pleading. They, it had cases, it had quotes from the case, it was wonderful. Yeah, it was all hallucination, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so this guy, without checking it, yep. files it with a federal court. Yep. And, you know, the judge is trying to find these cases, his adversaries are trying to find these cases. Yep. He goes back to ChatGPT, the original lawyer, and he says, are you sure about this? And Chat, oh yeah, trust me, boss. Mm, yeah. and, uh, and it was all made up. Right. And, and so that's a very powerful lesson in in what it can do and what right now it can't and why you have to be an involved manager of the process. The lawyers that took down that pleading do enough about law to be able to do it. Yep. And that, that begins to get at the question of what is it we should be teaching right now. And that's one reason I, I had that graphic up about how quickly ChatGPT has been adopted. We're used to things with long cycle times. We are not used to things that are happening in real time, even as we're trying to grapple with what's going on. And that's where we are. Yep. We have no time. Yep. Well, that's, that's a really interesting point. And I think telling them the consequences of not doing this kind of stuff is important. You lose a case as a lawyer, or you have some so there's vulnerability in software that you're building or that, that, that's there. These are things that are real tangible outcomes that if you don't do this well, it's the real world. And I think that's reminding them that this stuff really does matter and it's actually there and it's not a game that we're playing here. It's a, a, you have the opportunity to affect the world outside of here. I wanted to fin finalize on one, uh, finish on one of the last questions. We've got five minutes left, so I'm gonna try to go down the entire panel in five minutes, but here's the question. What would you say to instructors who, that have chosen not to implement generative AI, maybe ChatGPT, into their classroom um, to help with any kind of their content there? Um, what would you say to the instructors who are just afraid and say, I don't want to do that or I'm scared of implementing that in my classroom? What would be, what would be your message to the, those instructors? Brad, you want to talk? You're wrong. You yeah. should be fired. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I don't know if you should be fired. I don't agree. I don't, I don't co-sign be fired, but maybe, maybe like, there's some real thinking that's out there. Ryan? Um, I think it's going to be, uh, it's something that is already available to everybody and ignoring it is not going to help your students, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of what you've been saying this whole time. The other thing is, it's it's there to help you too. Um, think about, thinking about the things that you might not have been able to do in your classroom that are too time consuming or um, too challenging or you know just take up too much time. Th th think about how you can restructure your course to increase your learning outcomes and use ChatGPT yourself as a partner at, with a critical eye and incorporate it into your own processes because you can be more effective yourself, even if your students aren't necessarily using it or encouraged to use it, mm -hmm. you can make your classroom more effective that way. Yeah, Jane. I would challenge those instructors by saying, are you scared of using ChatGPT because of the impact it would have on students' learning or are you just scared of the work that you have to do to restructure your class to involve it? Mm -hmm. I, maybe I'm lucky because I came into teaching knowing that this was a thing and I could structure my curriculum around it but you're genuinely doing your students a disservice by not embracing the technologies that are coming and preparing them for how they're able to use that in their futures. Jan, what do you think? So I think that when we were in uh, middle school, maybe depending on, on, on when we were in middle school, we weren't allowed to use calculators. Um, we weren't allowed to use Wikipedia. We weren't allowed to use uh, a, a number of these uh, resources that are as a next step, like a, a very big next step from a grammar checker, right? Um, it, it's now grammar checker that brainstorms with you. Um, I have more frustration with my students not using ChatGPT and submitting, let's say, broken grammar uh, 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 text, this more grad student side of things, um, than with using ChatGPT. And I think that instructors that fight so heavily against generative AI use um, are going to find themselves in a similar situation where, you know, sure, it's very important to be able to add two numbers together in your head, but uh, I don't think anyone is going to say that, hey, you shouldn't never be using calculators, you know, in, in, in coursework, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's a tool on the same level. Yeah. And I would, I would add one thing, too. There's an equity issue here. Mm -hmm. The good students are gonna pick it up regardless of yeah. what we teach. 
those professors that choose not to use ChatGPT are hurting the ones that want to stay away from it or yep. feel they can't do it. They're hurting the people that need it the most. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, it, it, it's it, unconscionable. Yeah, yeah. It, I, it does. I think it does offer unique uh, equitizing ability across education, and I think that's a huge opportunity for that. No one asked me, but like, I, what I would say to to this sort of thing is like, I. It is in your classroom whether you want to acknowledge it or not. It is better if you proactively kind of address that uh, that it's there and teach students how to take their mindset into that kind of thing. Once you force it underground, this will evolve quickly enough that once you force it underground and people have to hide it from you, you will never be able to catch back up with it because you won't be able to learn how they're using it or be able to do the things like Jenny's doing, which is to identify how, how he's going. We got, a, we, got a, we got another panelist, look at that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. On that note, I want to I, I thank you guys for all of that. I would say I've got my email address up there. If you have additional questions or other things you want to follow up with the panelists, send them through me, and I'll get them out to everybody else if you have other things you want to follow up with us. This has been really great. I really appreciate you guys taking well, the time. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yay.